Buenos días a todos y a todas. Tras esta maravillosa pieza musical que sobrecoge el alma, vamos a dar comienzo a la primera mesa de la mañana. En ella vamos a hablar de la perspectiva de género. Si ayer nos pasábamos todo el día escuchando cómo es juzgar con perspectiva de género, hoy abordaremos cómo es la aplicación de la perspectiva de género en el resto de los operadores jurídicos. Vamos a hablar desde la Fiscalía, desde la Abogacía, la Forensía, una aplicación de la perspectiva de género. Bien, para ello me acompañan en la mesa diferentes personas, falta una de ellas que se incorporará a lo largo de la mañana y he de deciros que voy a ser muy estricta con el tiempo porque así se me plantea desde la organización, el tiempo es importante, queremos todos y todas poder escucharnos y por lo tanto cada interviniente tiene únicamente 12 minutos, cuando transcurran 10 os mandaré una nota de aviso y seré estricta con los dos minutos siguientes. Lo aviso para que no parezca maleducada sino que es una cuestión de que todo el mundo tenga su uso en la palabra. Y para comenzar vamos a eh, escuchar a doña Rita Mota Sousa, que es fiscal especialista en violencia de género en Portugal y es autora del libro Introducción a las teorías feministas del derecho. Ella nos va a hablar de esa aplicación de la perspectiva de género dentro de lo que es la fiscalía. Y ya sin más, doña Rita tiene la palabra. Sí. Bueno, buenos días a todas y a todos aquí. Muchas gracias a la organización... So, uh, thanks to the organization, especially to Gloria, for inviting me to be here. Es una gran honra, eh, It's an honor to be here. I'm really excited to, to learn so much sharing all these experiences. So I'd like to talk to you about a specific situation that takes place in Portugal the implementation of a consensus measure by the public ministry. This legal institute well, it's the first step where uh, the first step in a criminal procedure. This is decided by, by the public ministry, so this is implemented to those situations where we consider that we are, excuse me, to those situations where we consider that there are a small social, little social damage. So this is a consensus measure for instance you may have to pay some money to to the claimant do some follow some program and if you fulfill that program it will be maybe three months And if all the program is followed, the dossier is closed without registering any criminal record for that uh, person. This is very much used. Only 12% of all the processes in Portugal are finally judged. In, if there are signs to take that person to court, this measure is applied in 35.5% of those processes. So this is a measure which is very much used. And 82% of these cases are, mm, are closed. And now regarding these procedures about violence against women, in Portugal this is called domestic violence. This is the third type of crime where we apply the most this measure, which is provisional 
cancellation of the process. In 2016, it was applied in 2,454 cases. For instance, in case of an aggression, in this case, it was applied in 1,700 occasions. So th this measure is very much applied to gender crimes cases, as you can see. There are some problems with this because Istanbul Convention, Section 80, 48, says that you cannot implement alternative processes to uh, settle conflicts or to give compulsory judgments. So all alternative processes to settle compulsory conflicts are prohibited, including mediation and conciliation with all forms of violence foreseen in the Convention. This is this way because these cases cannot made invisible by justice. You cannot mm, encourage the victim to, to, recon to reconcile with the attacker. So it's also important regarding this, this, this gender violence issue, it's important to have a conviction. And so in this regard, it's important that courts don't make these cases invisible. This is a quote of a woman disappeared in a Portuguese newspaper, she was telling her relationship with the aggressor. I feel pity. I want to, I like to go back to our, uh, to our good times. We loved each other very much. We used to love each other very much. It's a, it's a strong fight within myself. I shouldn't love to someone who tried to kill me, but it's not that easy. So th 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 these are very hard situations. They are not easy because the accuser is the offendant. But normally, victims feel some uh, affection. Uh, the, there's a relationship, there are children, so it's not so, uh, that easy for them. That is to say that in some situations it may be useful to apply the uh, provisional uh, suspension of the process, but in order to ap apply it at general levels to all uh, uh, violence against women cases, that's not appropriate according to uh, what the Istanbul Convention says. This suspension in violence against women must be required uh, freely by the victim. In other cases, it's the prosecutor's office, the one who decides that, and then it proposes to the accused. It, to the accused. Here, it's not a, the prosecutor's office who decides it. It's the victim. The suspension delay can take two years in case of violence against women, domestic violence. Uh, not normally it's two years, but for uh, violence against women, uh, the time frame may be up to five years. And the attacker may have to follow a program of eight months. So the most positive effect of this implementation is that uh, very often it's hard for the victim to, to face the justice system because they, she, it's very important for her to, 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 to feel reinforced in, 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 in the relation she has with the justice system and not to feel judged as it happens sometimes, because this is very hard for her. The implementation of, of this mm, measure avoids that. In Portugal, crimes are public. 
So the criminal procedure does not depend on the will of the victim. There is a law that says that in case of a family relationship between the victim and the offender, in case of violence against women, if the victim does not want to cooperate, many cases are closed for that reason. So the implementation of this measure allows to to, to continue the process. using this consensus measure. Only 7% of all reports regarding domestic violence finish in, in a conviction. And this suspension is applied to most of half of those procedures that are not closed. Normally, the victim should require the implementation of the uh, temporary suspension of the process. But it may happen that it is suggested, inducted to the victim so that she requires it. So that's not, uh, that's, that's not uh, required freely, not being positive this way. And it is very important. They should have a restoration justice perspective, restorative justice perspective, repairing the victim and also sending a, a signal to, to, to the society that these behaviors are not tolerated. It shouldn't be seen as a way of suspending the effects of uh, criminal justice or, or, or mediation processes, but as a solution to the conflict. Yeah, I'm finishing. Grevio is the team that makes the assessment uh, of the implementation of Istanbul Convention didn't like very much uh, such a general implementation of this provisional suspension of the procedure in my country. They say that the will of the victim must be respected. If she doesn't want to take the case to court, that's her will and should be respected. This sends a message to the society that justice tolerates these kind of situations. Because this means sending a message that justice does not tolerate these kind of situations, as I said before. It's also important to say this. Victims, Grevio recommended that Portugal should invest on measures to prove uh, the situation or have the cooperation of the victim to, to continue with the procedure in case it is finally judged. We all have to, to, to do this. We have to support the victims with compassion. We have to empower them during the investigation phase so that they not withdraw the complaint l later in order that they can explain in a clear and coherent way to the judge. This is uh, for uh, victims, the way they are treated during the procedure is as important as the very conviction. That's why the right for information assistance 
all the relation with the victim mediated by the public ministry, the prosecutor's office during the investigation phase is of the essence. I'd like to finish with this quote by a woman about the behavior of the judicial system during the trial. The quote is the following. It's very confusing when I arrived to court and I saw they were judging one case after the other. There are so many cases in a row. How can they be concentrated? How can they focus on my case? Because they were always looking the documents before asking me the questions. They didn't even remember them. So that's that happens. Thank you very much for your attention. Países diferentes experiencias. Different countries, very similar experience. I'm sure we can all imagine that this still happens in all the countries of the world. Now, Elena Ocejo Álvarez, she's a lawyer at the Bar Association in Oviedo, president of the, of the Association of Women Lawyers for Equality. She has created a guide called Lawyer in Assistance with a Gender Perspective. She will present us this tool, which is very practical in our, in our duty. ¿Así? ¿Se oye? Sí. Bueno, buenos días a todas y a todos. Tenemos muy poco tiempo. Eh, dos palabras. Good morning to you all. Two words. Thank you and congratulations. Thanks to the Association of Women Judges. Gloria, above all, for... for Counting on us, our collective has a lot to say. We're very proud to be here. And congratulations also for this initiative, for, for the strength, and for existing, just for that. It's the other picture, please. I'd like to begin my intervention uh, as a lawyer and representative in this Congress with a picture by, uh, of Maria Tello in 1936. She was a lawyer and a jurist. I'd like to pay tribute to her, taking advantage of this, of my intervention, because in 1952 she became a lawyer at the Bar Association of Madrid. She came from the feminist movement, and even if she's very important as a lawyer, because thanks to her we could modify the civil code in family matters and mainly regarding the married woman in 1969 I discovered something great in that year 50 years ago she was a member of the International Federation of, of Legal Women Women she organized during the dictatorship of Franco a congress of women from all over the world with uh, legal careers Notary publics, lawyers. She gathered here 61 women. The findings of that Congress, let's see the other picture. That's Maria Tello opening this Congress. Very close to here in the Bar Association of Madrid. So 50 years later, we're still here, lagging a little bit behind. But I'd like to pay tribute to her because of this. Excuse me, I don't have much time, so she took advantage of that Congress to, uh, to be part of the coding of, of the Commission of the Ministry of Justice to amend the Civil Code, and they were working during four years. The basis, the Civil Code we had back then said that the married woman must follow the condition and the nationality of the husband. She has to obey to the husband. The husband is a representative of the, of the, of the wife. Without his authorization, he can't go to trial. I mean, the marital license was essential for women. The only thing they could do was uh, make a will, grant a will. During four years, they worked with the civil code. You can imagine that, that those times, there were four women in that committee. And four years later, there was a law in 1975 regarding the legal situation of the married woman and the 
law of 1981 regarding affiliation and parental authority. These laws um, put the woman in an equal situation regarding the man. We already had back then the Constitution of 1978. So in that moment, we had real and formal equality. Maria Tello, she was not very much recognized, but in 2009, she received the honoris causa PhD. She was 94 years old. And during her speech, she's saying legal equality doesn't mean uh, de facto e equality. That's the, the way we have to to take uh, 50 years later trying to achieve that real, actual equality. So if we're claiming justice with a gender perspective, if we want judgments with a gender perspective, our collective lawyering cannot lag behind. Quite the opposite. We must be um, dynamizers. We have to work with, with a gender focus. And in our daily demands, we have to use that gender focus which is so necessary to achieve that real equality. Lawyering was also an engine for, for change, to mobilize societies regarding everything which is related to rights. Um, the right for equality must be of the essence for us. And that's when the F Lawyering Foundation requested Maria, Martina, and me to work on this and create some easy material for our colleagues to implement this gender perspective. So we drafted this guide, which is a gender focus to lawyering. It's on the website of the Lawyering Foundation. You can download it for free on PDF format. So in this guide, there's a general part where we talk about equal rights, non-discrimination, right to judicial protection, and how to detect gender stereotypes. Normally, we say that we have to wear the purple, purple glasses. We need a gender perspective to know what we're talking about, because Laws are not neutral. Because normally when we implement the law, in most of occasions, they go against women. In this guide, we do what we call the gender path. We come from a key law in our country, uh, three, uh, law three from um, slash 2007, where Section 4 is of the essence. It's the law for equality between men and women. Because we say that cases must be brought forward, taking into account this article. Equality is an information principle of law. This means that when interpreting the law, we must interpret it from this section. The Civil Code says that law interpretation should be done in, in those times where, where we are, so we are in, in times of equality. So we have to point that to all judges so that they take into account that um, our times uh, are claiming for equality. So we follow this gender path with section 9 and 14 of the Constitution without forgetting that we have uh, supranational tools I always say that what we have is very good. Let's put it in place. Uh, let's execute that. Let's work from there. But we cannot forget the Sadar Convention. We talked yesterday here about that. And we cannot forget about the Istanbul, Istanbul Convention. We have to use all those tools to convince uh, judges that they have to implement this gender perspective, which is so necessary. Then, in the guide, we talk about different law domains where it is most needed, where you have to detect these gender stereotypes. Criminal jurisdiction, uh, civil jurisdiction, obstetric violence, that's a taboo. There are many uh, reports. There, there's much violence to women in 
when, when they give birth to a child. Now there's a case in Oviedo where we come from, uh, where there's a vulneration of the body and the will of a woman. And we also talk about family law. I'd like to join this, to link this with what Maria Tello said in 2009 during her speech, because family law is where, where many gender stereotypes underlies. There we have the mother, the woman, who after a divorce suffers the most, because normally, you may say, it's the father who leaves the home, he has to spend money for another home, but normally women during the marriage, they renounce to, to, to promote in her professional career. During that crisis, they go through a very painful situation. That's implementing gender perspective knowing where we come from and how this same situation impacts on men and women. Going back to Maria Tello in 2009, she said, what's the new path we have to follow so that a woman within the family is respected as a human being? I say, I say within the family, because it's there where we create all the inequalities, even reaching to violence against women and her death, because the roles of men and women in the family are not equal, are unequal. And talking about family inequalities, I'd like to finish in the guide. We talk about many jurisprudence, but I'd like to mention here a judgment of November 2018 by the Supreme Court Civil Division here in Spain, where responding to an appeal by, by the prosecutor's office. The report was the cessation of the use to the ordinary dueling by, for the mother. The prosecutor's office appealed because she underst it understood that um, the rights of the children and the mother were not being protected. There was a judgment say, saying that um, children could stay in the family home until they were of legal age. The curious thing here regarding the use of the family home says that introducing a third person in the home with a stable relationship changes the status of family home. Because that use The family home is the home where the family coexisted as such. So in this regard, as a third person arrives, the marriage purpose are no longer there. So in that case, that's a different family. So you have to understand that a crucial moment where, according to the Supreme Court, changes the status of that family is not during the divorce, where the parent goes, the father goes to another home or the mother goes to another home, the status of the family changes where, when another person, part of familias, the French colleague yesterday talked about part of familias, it changes in that moment. It's a different family. So where was that family during the divorce? the mother with the children, is that the same family? That's gender perspective. This is a lack of uh, gender perspective. So he has implied many mm, demands to change the nature of what's considered to be the family home. So with this measure, women will have a worse economic situation because the Supreme Court says that the drilling can be sold and uh, split the amount of, of the sale between men and women. 
We can revert this with the law, with all the tools we have, and appeal into the principle of equality and the damage that this causes. Thank you. Bueno, y ahora a continuación salimos del derecho y viajamos a la medicina. Le vamos a dar la palabra a don Miguel Lorente Acosta, es médico forense, experto en violencia de So now we're going to hear from an expert in gender violence, a forensic doctor, Miguel Lorente Acosta. So we give you the floor. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. To the 16 colleagues that I know in the room that I've seen. And first of all, to, I would like to thank the Spanish Association of Women Judges and the International Association of Women Judges for inviting me here. Thank you to the Spanish Association for organizing this and Gloria Payato. And thank you to the, mm, my colleagues with whom uh, I have collaborated over the years at different events and courses. We're all uh, here together in this process of ongoing learning. Also, the Secretary of State for Equality for welcoming us and uh, helping us uh, to get together here. I would like to just talk about how forensic medicine can help us to achieve the objective of um, delivering justice with a gender perspective. We need the gender perspective right from the very first moment. I would like to do this, well, I could mm, give a very general um, talk about the application of femicide to understand its importance. Uh, I'm going to use a picture of an autopsy in this presentation. I warn you because it could be uh, a little bit shocking, but I think it's going to be very useful so that we can understand what I want to explain. These pictures are from a case that we saw. The difference between one picture and the other is not to be found in the entry point uh, of the bullet or the pathway through the skull or the characteristics of the exit wound, but in fact the difference between one situation and the other, homicide and suicide, the difference was to be found in the gender perspective. An initial study was carried out thinking it was a homicide, uh, sorry, thinking it was a suicide, and then after applying the gender perspective and looking at the general circumstances behind the crime, it was concluded that it was a homicide carried out by the partner of that woman. And this situation is not different to what we see with irregular homicides, according to the UN report. We can see at the top that how the homicides around the world are reducing despite the sophistication of criminal groups and organized crime. All of the means that they have, more complex instruments and tools, nonetheless, despite all of that, we are able to uh, prevent and reduce the number of homicides due to our specialist knowledge and the resources available to the uh, police forces. If we look, we can see at the bottom a flat level for femicide and even a slight increase. This is not a matter of technical means or professional training. This is an issue uh, related to the position we take uh, in these investigations. If we do not apply the gender perspective, then it will be difficult to us to be able to identify reality. The gender perspective, uh, contrary to what people might think, is not about having a special gift or a third eye which allows you to see uh, further than other people or to hear frequencies that other people can't detect. But no, gender perspective, if we're very graphic, is all about taking off uh, this patch that we have over our eyes, which has been positioned by sexism. We have to make sure that we take a look with a critical approach, of course, looking at reality and the facts and what has taken place. We have to understand that there is no neutral position. There is no different place compared to the non-application of gender perspective. If we don't apply the gender perspective, we are applying the patriarchal perspective. We have the traditional historical position, which um, give us our understanding of reality and our interpretation of reality. 
how the facts are understood and how we carry out our analysis and look at the proof. We can do that from the patriarchal, traditional point of view, or we can make an effort to do it with a gender perspective. So we shouldn't think that there is a neutral area where we are neither sexist nor using a gender perspective. Basically, we are either patriarchal or we use a gender perspective. So if we use that perspective, uh, well, I've worked in forensics to develop the Latin American protocol model for the investigation of um, femicide. This is important. We have to understand that this gender perspective needs to be obtained through training and studying and we need to achieve this by means of social transformation. If we don't have social transformation, which allows us to develop this integrated overall vision within the social meaning, it would be very difficult for us to get a uniform and widespread change in any field, in medicine, in justice, in law, or in psychology. We need to have social transformation that accompanies the change in our uh, approach to reality and a, a way of approaching, sorry, of progressing to change our critical approach involves protocols and guidelines which can help people to apply those changes when it comes to investigating a case. In Latin America, the model protocol is based on the idea that feminicide can be presented in many different ways. The protocol covers three main groups, but obviously there are other possible circumstances, but they all rotate around the construction of criminal behavior with regards to the, uh, the causes or the motivation behind gender violence. And this means that we have specific characteristics in each of the main groups, in feminicide, in the sexual fear, sphere, or in organized criminal groups. But at the same time, we are talking about a moral crime. It's carried out to defend ideas, values, this, the, the, the idea of a valid man, as well as a, an emotional component, which influences the way this violence is um, inflicted. What's more, this protocol explains that in forensic situations, when we have a violent death of a woman, whether it's homicide or suicide, or an accident, uh, the protocol states that the possible femicide should always be considered. We understand that that consideration of a possible femicide will not inf interfere with the investigation because it involves standard procedures, but taking into account elements which could uh, indicate femicide. And it and make sure we do not get confused and we do not rule out certain situations. If proof has not been gathered correctly, uh, this could lead to um, a failure to reach the right conclusion. From the point of view of investigation of a possible femicide, this isn't just based on um, occasional uh, facts or, or a limited uh, view of uh, the traditional approach. We have to take into account the circumstances that have surrounded the events. And we have to look at the background, the records of that victim and the offender, as well as the posterior, the subsequent uh, events regarding the image of the victim, as well as the position or situation of the offender. We have to f uh, try to achieve continua con a continuation between those elements, and this is what we can uh, encompass in the investigation in its broadest term in order to reach the conclusion that we are looking at a femicide. I'm sorry that this uh, device doesn't seem to be working particularly well. I want to say, or oh, what I want to do is to explain that we're not just talking about deeds or specific facts when we are looking at a femicide. We can have significant elements, but it, here we're talking about a way of inflicting violence. Oh, the whole meaning of the behavior needs to be taken into account in a broader context uh, so that we understand what happened before the crime and what happened afterwards. 
So often the key information can be found there, which is uh, perhaps far removed from the act itself and can help us to give us clues. If we talk about the relations, um, the, the romantic relationships or family relationships and uh, signs that we can detect in such cases, we have different elements related to the autopsy, for example, the postmortem, and also the people in the victim's closest circle. All of this is related to femicide. There's excessive violence, for example. The mechanism or the instrument that's most used is a knife, and the number of stabs on average is 23. When we talk about blows, the average number of head injuries is 18. So there are certain elements that show excessive violence, which can be related to the circumstances of femicide. It's an emotional element within that behavior. If we bring all of these elements together, we can carry a, we can um, reach a situation uh, which brings us close to femicide. So it's all about looking for these signs, this information in these areas. We can find elements associated to femicide, and this can lead us to a conclusion in terms of its compatibility with a femicide context. When we have many of these elements I've mentioned, we could um, come up with a decision, or well, obviously it's the, uh, the decision, the court's decision that is final. We can just give indications. And depending on the number of these elements that are found to be present, then uh, the more likely we are to conclude that we're talking about a case of femicide. As Bertillon said, it, what's important is to know that what we're looking at and what we include in the investigation is what we have in our mind. If we do not have the right training or take the right perspective or we have a critical position, in the end we will see reality, but we won't be able to give meaning to it. And as I have said, as Elena mentioned, the gender perspective is very important when enforcing law, but also we need a feminist uh, uh, view in order to progress in society. So if we apply both of those perspectives, we will be able to really make progress. Thank you very much. Well, following on from that, we're going to hear from Gemma Fernandez Rodriguez de Liebana. She belongs to Women's Link Worldwide. And they work to defend the rights of women and girls. She's going to talk about the international standards for the enforcement or the, the application of the gender perspective. So thank you very much. Good morning. Thank you very much to Gloria for the invitation, uh, to, um, for inviting Women's Link to join you here, and for the opportunity to join so many brave women here. I would like to start off with this uh, quote. Uh, the uh, judiciary has the power to permit equality to grow and flourish to meet the legitimate demands and aspirations of the world's population. They also have the power to deny it. So as judges, uh, you have uh, the power to play an important role in democracy when fundamental rights, such as the right of equality and non-discrimination, are attacked. You are a powerful force, as Susana Medina said. I, I loved what she said. I don't think she's here in the room with us, but for us, for lawyers and activists in human rights, the role and your role as women judges is fundamental. It's truly important. Women's Link is a human rights uh, organization. We use the power of law to promote social change to favor the rights of women and girls, above all those who suffer multiple kinds of discrimination. We look at the structural failings of the justice system and the human rights protection system. We identify cases which are strategic, uh, aiming, well, besides helping the women, 
we work to improve the system for all women and girls. If I come back to that quote, it refers to the ability of the judiciary to really make a difference. We, in Women's Link, we have invented what we call uh, the um, awards for gender equality decisions. It's a kind of competition that we organize, uh, the Gender and Justice Awards, we could call them. And here, well, you can um, propose possible winners of these awards uh, for good and bad decisions. I think it's important to uh, also mention what a good title uh, was chosen for this conference, um, Judging with Gender Perspective. And that has been uh, a very good title. We're talking about having a justice system which uh, um, really uh, meets our needs in society and the challenge that that represents. We have tens of women, tens of, uh, of, of women um, who are killed every year, and we have lots of sexual violence, sexual exploitation, and women trafficking. But if we talk about gender perspective injustice, well, this is something that is questioned and attacked nowadays by some people who refuse the need to assist women and, and the, the unequal situation of women, or at least they deny that gender is the issue behind those situations. I would like what I would like to argue here is that if we apply a gender perspective injustice, this is essential in order to. Um, really carry out the uh, constitutional demand for equality. It's not a matter of the level of sensitivity of the people involved in the justice system, uh, but rather it's indispensable in order to ensure effective equality in that it should have a real impact in the life of women. And above all, um, for those who belong to uh, a social group, group which receives um, unfavorable treatment or is subordinated with uh, within society. If we talk about law and gender, well, when we talk about gender, we're talking about biological differences between sex. It's also an ideological and cultural issue which affects the distribution of resources, wealth, work, and decision-making, and the political world, as well as the, uh, the, uh, the ability to enjoy rights in private and public life. When we talk about law has a gender, well, this is because law is a product of society over the course of history and is related to um, power relationships, but also law is interpreted by uh, individuals uh, uh, who live in a context in which gender has an impact, as well as uh, race and age, for example. If we take this into account, we have to take into account the, the gender bias, the bias, and how to neutralize this by means of practices which overcome inequality, so that justice will become a universal asset. We're not talking about something which is purely for women, but rather we are looking at the parameters for the um, delivery of justice. And we must understand that uh, it is uh, the system generally uh, leads to an unfavorable treatment of women. If we look at the international, international texts on gender perspective justice, Mm, we can see this reflected. I would like to encourage you all to use international law, both in the judiciary and as lawyers. We must apply human rights uh, as established at an international level. As was mentioned yesterday, uh, yesterday in the morning and the afternoon, the treaty is the CEDAW Convention. That's really... Um, the most important one. And I would like to just talk about the work of the committee of the CEDAW Convention. We know that the main functions of that committee are to regularly review the statute, the, the state, sorry, to see how it is being applied and to make um, recommendations about certain articles. The general recommendations are a guideline for interpretation of the convention and for its application. I've been, well, I quit look this morning I, this, I think the all the states represented here have ratified the convention we have then the uh, 
professional protocol. Ah, I'm seeing that there are... No, of course, yes, the US. I didn't realize there was somebody here from the US. Yes, that's true. The US has not signed that convention. And then we have the uh, protocol for individual communication and the uh, initiation of investigation when there is serious uh, violation of the rights. It, the Article 5 talks about the obligation of the states to work to eliminate gender stereotypes. When we talk about stereotypes, it can seem quite abstract, social and cultural, but the states are obliged under international law to eliminate these stereotypes and above all in the area of justice. The committee has a number three recommendation which states that the it has to be a study of the obligations to make sure that women have access to justice. And this covers the, also the presence of stereotypes and gender uh, prejudice in the justice systems and it provides recommendations which are specific for each area in law, criminal, civil. Um, if you're not familiar with that recommendation, I suggest that you read it. It's also been translated into the five official UN languages. If we stop for a moment to talk about gender stereotypes, what is a stereotype? Well, it's a generalized, a widespread, preconceived view regarding the characteristics or the features of a particular group or the roles that the members of that group should fulfill. Stereotypes presume that all the people in a social group have particular characteristics. For example, teenagers are irresponsible, all of them. Or that they have specific roles that are uh, assigned culturally. For example, women are carers. So the, uh, these stereotypes or stereotyping uh, is a process uh, can be useful to help people to simplify the world and to understand the world. We tend to generalize about the characteristics that we perceive in a particular group, which can sometimes even be positive. For example, Spanish people are very cheerful or German people are very well organized and hardworking. However, this process is problematic because when it's used to ignore certain characteristics and skills and needs and circumstances of a particular person, it's particularly problematic when this stereotyping is done in authorities and this then has an impact on rights above all the access to justice. If we understand how law can contribute to gender stereotypes, it helps us to understand the need to include mechanisms to correct those processes. I think it's all about looking inside ourselves and identifying the stereotypes that we ourselves have to recognize the harm uh, caused in other people by those stereotypes and how their rights are affected and to try to distance ourselves from them when taking decisions. The committee has examined case law looking at the role of stereotypes and how they have a negative impact on women, how they are linked to the causes of violence and impunity and how they represent an obstacle to access to justice and the fact that they are one of the last barriers in, this, in the battle to eliminate discrimination against women. I've only got two minutes, so I'd like to finish talking about um, transformative equality. I think this is a very powerful concept. It arises from a, the question uh, that we could ask uh, why after 20, 30, 40, 50 years, after many conventions, different constitutions and laws against sexual discrimination, promoting equality between men and women and the elimination of violence. Why, after so many years of having these texts in place, why discrimination and violence against women is still widespread in all countries? The, according to the words of the committee in 2017, it's, it's still widespread in all countries. So when facing this reality, we talk about this transformational equality, uh, official or formal equality is not enough. And it questions uh, the, the issue of, um, well, the fact that women have the right to enjoy 
Right, but it states that, but it al allows the structure to continue, which in fact um, uh, discriminates against women. We're not looking at or aspiring to a neutral future. No, we're, we are looking to a future that takes into account, actively takes into account gender and its impact. The future does not appear in terms of allowing women to get access to the world of men. No, what we are talking about is a restructuring of society, which should no longer be a, a society of men. We need to redistribute power and resources and change the structures that perpetuate the disadvantaged situation of women. Justice is or can be a mechanism for uh, redress, but it cannot limit itself to of just returning women to the position they had prior to their discrimination. No, it has to be able to transform the conditions which allow their rights to be violated. Thank you very much. Next, Katharina Miller, President of the EWLA, who is in charge of labor counseling within the European Union. She will tell us about an idea that we are all agents for change with legal tools in our ha at our hands, and we must fulfill that obligation of transforming the world with those legal tools. You have the word. Thank you very much. First of all, I'd like to thank in Spanish, then I'll turn to English. I warn you. Thanks to Gloria. Gloria, I'd like you to know that you are a magnificent woman, great woman. You are mm, making changes here in Spain. It's not always easy. You always help me as Maria Eugenia. And with you too, I feel really uh, supported. I like to say it here publicly, so thank you very much, both of you. Uh, it's, it's moving, uh, really. Why? Because working in this gender issue in the corporate world is not easy. I have many enemies, among them many women, and uh, fighting this is difficult. I am um, also about my background which is quite curious I think. Yeah, I give you time. Sorry to the translators and thank you for your work. <laughs> yeah, you might ask yourself this German accent but she's Spanish. Yeah. I was uh, German born but I gave up my my German citizenship to become Spanish. Um, because I love Spain, I think Spain is a wonderful country and I wanted also to give this statement. And that's why I'm Spanish now, but with a German accent, which I will never ever lose. So, <laughs> having said this, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> having said this, uh, I'm the president of this wonderful uh, NGO, which is 18, 18 years old. And uh, we are the federation of all 28 uh, national women lawyers associations and also EFTA from the EFTA countries, European Union and EFTA. We are also happy uh, to be a federation for all of you if you want to join us because I personally think we really have to unite synergies because it's a very dangerous world and I think we can only survive uh, sticking together, supporting each other. Um, now, um, I have been the president of this NGO for two years now, and I'm a corporate lawyer. That's why my mandate, or this, that's why for the last two years, the NGO was, was very much focused on the corporate world. Also, um, in general, I think our duty is to work within the, what, what's called EU Gender Equality Aki. That's where you enter, the judges. Because the EU Gender Equality Acquis is a mixture of all European legislation, that means directives, um, uh, yeah, reglamentos, sometimes I miss uh, also English words. <laughs> um, sorry, translators. <laughs> um, but also judgments. And I called, as Maria well said, I call myself a change agent. I'm working for civil society, but I'm, we need you. 
We need you, we need good judgments. And I give you an example now, two examples. The first example, we have been working from 2014 until 2016, tackling uh, women in leadership positions. Why? Because we think women have to be everywhere. We have to reach, we have to be in every single little part of the society, also in leadership positions. And, um, but we also know that with a strong regulations, we are fans, we think we need strong regulations, we are big fans of quota regulations with hard sanctions because without hard sanctions no quota regulation works in our opinion. But we also need you to later apply these laws. So when we were work working, or myself, I was working as a shareholder activist, going to the annual shareholder meetings of the big listed Spanish companies, asking awkward questions like, Mr. Um, yeah, Anna Botin, Banco Santander, what are you doing for leaders, leadership, female leadership in your bank? Then for me, it's very helpful to be able to quote judgments from the European Court of Justice, for example. For example, Marshall, the Marshall judgment from 1993. Why? Because whenever a company hears quota legislation, they have like a red flag. They get red, very angry, and they don't want to hear anything about quotas. And because they say they are afraid, they have to, they have to take every woman that is walking on the street and put her on the board, literally. So then I can take your judgment and I can say, listen, read Marshall. And Marshall says that because there is stereotyped thinking, we are all biased. And women have it still more difficult to, be, to get pregnant, to be mothers, and to work in companies, and to get into leadership positions. That's why we need a quota. Because a quota means that between two quali equally qualified people, men and women, you just take the woman. A quota doesn't mean we take just any women walking on the street. This is Marshall and this is thanks to you. That's why we need you. And please, we have to be on this together. So this, uh, you can later read about uh, our initiative. It's called, um, I'm sorry, we are lawyers. That's why the title is not good. It's not catchy and it's not sexy. <laughs> it's called Gender Balanced Leadership, European Women Shelters Pave the Way. We have it in English and in Spanish. And um, I also have a video. But before we see the video, I want to tell you another, story, um, another project we have been working on this year. And there I also want to invite you to, to stick together and to work together because every, we all have to work together on this. And I'm talking about the fourth industrial revolution and ethics. Dear ladies and gentlemen, there's something going on in this world which I myself don't really understand. I have no clue what is blockchain about. I'm reading about it on and on, but I still don't understand it. But we have to be there. We have to be active, proactive change agents. We have to embrace this digital transformation because it's happening without us. And this is not good. It's dangerous. It's dangerous for our democracies. It's dangerous for our future. And I want to be a proactive change agents and that's why this year my, my NGO we are working uh, with monthly webinars uh, about this topic um, the fourth industrial revolutions and ethics from a gender legal perspective and we are going to have a congress about it on the 21st and 22nd of November here in Madrid and it's from a multi-stakeholder approach and the Mujeres Juezas will participate as well why? Because we need everybody on board. We have to mix each other. We have to listen to each other, engineers, lawyers, judges. We have, everybody has to be on board to really em embrace the change. So if you feel, if you want, in every country, every country, because this is about all of us. And um, yeah, now I want to invite you to watch our image video about our initiative, um, Gender Balanced Leadership, European Women Shelters Pave the Way. There is nothing else. It's the campaign of the 21st century, and it's for the next generation. I'm 
besten wäre, ist natürlich, es würde alles von selbst gehen. Die Wirtschaft würde das von alleine regeln. It's no one's fault. It is historical. Es geht darum, Gewohnheiten und Überzeugungen, die über Jahrzehnte und Jahrhunderte äh, verwurzelt sind, äh, auch zu verändern. We need everyone to campaign together, definitely. But we do need women to stand up first and foremost. Und dadurch, dass wir uns zusammengeschlossen haben, können wir uns gegenseitig stützen und helfen. Und das finde ich einfach äh, unglaublich. Also es ist unglaublich bereichernd und auch inspirierend. Et je trouve que on est on, on est pile sur un projet très européen parce que le projet a été initié par des Allemandes. Ein europäisches Projekt hat viele europäische Partner mit einzubeziehen aus Spanien, Frankreich und die Benelux Staaten, aber natürlich wollten wir das richtig europäisch machen. Et ce qu'on a déjà fait, l'idée, c'est qu'on puisse le dupliquer en Europe. Das ist einfach eine geniale Idee. Das ist einfach so simpel. It's a project that gets into real life. So there really women go to general assemblies of large companies and really stand up and ask to be treated equally. Was wir tun ist ein höchst demokratischer Akt. Eine Jahreshauptversammlung ist der absolute demokratische Höhepunkt im Leben eines Unternehmens. Elles sont parties dans les assemblées générales et ont posé des questions euh, qui sont des questions essentielles. Wie viele Frauen arbeiten in ihrem Unternehmen auf den zwei Führungsebenen unterhalb des Vorstandes? Warum habt ihr in eurem Aufsichtsrat und eurem Vorstand keine Frau, obwohl viele Frauen ja erst den Gewinn und den Umsatz im Unternehmen erarbeiten? Was muss ich mitbringen, damit ich tatsächlich auch eine Chance habe? Ist unter diese gläserne Decke zu kommen, da durchzustoßen und eben auch Mitglied in einem Vorstand zu sein. Maintenant, on va les poser dans toute l'Europe et ça c'est fondamental parce que c'est en posant des questions comme ça qu'on fait avancer les mentalités. And shareholders should be paying more attention to the fact that the boards are very male oriented, male dominated. Die Erfahrung der letzten Jahre zeigt, dass wir konkrete gesetzliche Regelungen brauchen. Wir wollen nicht, dass schlechter qualifizierte Frauen besser qualifizierten Männern vorgezogen werden. Aber wir wünschen uns natürlich gleichwohl, dass die Ziele ambitionierter sind und dass sie insbesondere auch darauf gerichtet sind, vielleicht dann auch mal überproportional Frauen einzustellen. If women don't get to the top positions, companies and countries are losing their potential. Wir brauchen genauso viele Frauen wie Männer in, in hohen Entscheidungspositionen in der Wirtschaft und in der Politik, weil die auf genau demselben Niveau kompetent oder inkompetent sein können äh, wie Männer. Frauen und Männer ergänzen sich gegenseitig gut, deswegen würde ich nie sagen 100% Frauen oder eben 100% Männer. But we want to have women at the place they deserve in society. Et c'est pour ça que je trouve que ce projet, il est absolument génial. This kind of project can really make a difference. There's definitely change happening, but I want to see more change happen. Ich wünsche mir, dass wir jetzt gemeinsam alles dafür tun, dass mehr Frauen und Führungsetagen ankommen. Insgesamt sind wir auf einem guten Weg, aber wir hätten eben da gerne Beschleunigung. We need everyone in this movement, we need everyone in this fight. It's only by combining our strategies, our thoughts, our, our brilliance, that we can move this really forward, progress. So they are all from working at the European Commission. Oh, she, is our federal, she was our federal minister for justice, minister for justice and gender equality. So really a high, uh, women in high positions. I know I've taken all my, uh, my time. Thank you very much for listening to me. Please feel invited to collaborate, cooperate, and let's start it. We can do it. Thank you. <laughs> Mike is not working. Please turn on the mic. Now we have Eugenia. Barcelona was the first bar association in Spain that changed its name. Eugenia will tell us about the equality plan of, of the bar association. You have the floor. Thank you. Ver thank you very much. It's working. Yeah, thank you. I'd like to begin by thanking Gloria 
and women judges Mar Serna, the representative in Catalonia of women judges, for the invitation to take part in this wonderful Congress, so essential, so important in these days, when cooperation of all the stakeholders, legal stakeholders, all the society, politicians, is of the essence to keep on making progress in the fight against inequalities, to, to get this real and effective equality that we all want since many years ago. Without any doubt, the role of our institutions, corporations, lawyering goes throughout all these years and is clear in our commitment to fight for equal rights for all citizens. We, lawyers, sometimes Sometimes we face the power and we claim for our citizens that their rights are respected and that equality and democracy and tolerance are respected. It is true that the history of women has a situation of inequality which is still there. That's why lawyers cannot stay silent about it. I'd like to describe how women's rights have evolved throughout the history of mankind. The Charter of the United Nations in 1945 was very uh, important to recognize equality here. We are people, we are legal subjects. Before where we were a protection subject, we could do nothing back then. And in this last 50 years, we are subjects of life. In public life, with with with, with uh, capacity to, to to act, in this last 50 years, this places us in an inequality situation. We have to fight from all um, levels. It's been relevant, decisive, the role of lawyers to transform society. Not only the role of lawyers, even the role of women lawyers who had the privilege to arrive before to this profession than you, judges. We began to join in a servicing associations back in 1910. We have to remember our references. We shouldn't forget those pioneer women who fought so that we could be here today. I'm thinking about Maria Tello, our beloved Concepcion Arenal, who had to disguise as a man to go to college and study law to receive this training. Training was our freedom. The freedom of women is training, education. That was the beginning of this path we are all doing together. As Katharina said, she thanked the synergies that we are all joining to, to achieve equality. Concepcion Arenal, Victoria Kent, but above all, I like to highlight Clara Campoamor. Because gender perspective, the first to put this on the table, this lack of gender perspective in Parliament, in front of all men, was her, Clara Campamor and Victoria Kent claiming the right for vote. That day, back in 1931, said to the politicians in power, she said, do you have the right to do this? No. You have the, role, the, the, the right granted to you by the law. And the law was made by you. Laws were made by you during so many years. You drafted laws. You made judgments. You interpreted uh, legislation. So, men. So the starting point was this law that they did. And we, during this half a century, we've been amended it, having new policies in the executive power, in the legislative power, the Deputy Prime Minister, the Minister of Justice, both women are fighting to, to improve this right. So, men did this law, but you don't have the fundamental right of all human beings. So let women state themselves, and you will realize how you can preserve this power alone. Because, dear friends, this is a matter of power, but 
in the most humble sense of the word, because if we are not in those responsibility positions, we won't be able to change things. If we, want, if we don't lead in institutions, we will never be able to impose equality plans. We will never be able to legislate with a gender perspective. We will never be able to judge with a gender perspective. So all progresses that we have to make must take into account the progress of mankind. So in, this was back in 1931, and until 1945 with the Charter of the Union and 1948 with the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, after the fact that Europe lived the most shameful and sad episodes of mankind, until 1944, the rights of women were not recognized. We said that uh, rights for people was essential in, uh, for all mankind and for the first time in history we place dignity on the life of people, both men and women, uh, as a superior good to protect, to create legal systems which are solid and stable that, makes, that make um, mankind uh, to progress. Only putting the woman on top will allow us to make progress because if we are not um, in senior positions, that will be a halt. We cannot take any step behind. So we, we must place this women's dignity on, on the first line uh, as an asset to protect. And advancing in this history, fighting for democracy, as uh, some lawyers like Paca Sauquillo, Cristina Almeida, so many women lawyers, labor lawyers, who fought for democracy. They fought for the rights of women workers. This was decisive with those laws in the year 1962, equalizing men and women at work. So the role of lawyers in the fight for freedoms uh, of women has been very important. So we as a bar association, we couldn't ignore our reality, which is going on in the lawyering world. 63% of women lawyers are women. But despite that, only 18% are um, partners in uh, uh, lawyers' bureau. So we have a glass ceiling. Uh, this is crystal clear. Women lawyers, we are majority. In the uh, Spanish Lawyering Council, we are 52%. But the pay gap represents 18%. What does this mean? Not only we're not in responsibility positions, the social pay gap of 18%. So we have to work one month and a half more than male lawyers to make the same money. This is real inequality. And our association wants to fight again to, to fix this. This inequality happens, pay, pay gap, uh, glass ceiling, also talent, the, the, the talent of a man is much more promoted uh, than women's talent. We may think that a woman shouldn't, um, uh, sh should put aside from um, most important uh, issues, we are given less responsibility than men, here also reconciliation is very important, we have to fight to educate children about this necessity. They have to um, have a joint responsibility with our partners. We all want to have children. We have to take care of our elderly people. Everyone ha has uh, our responsibilities at home and we all have to be responsible for these things, both men and women. Because we are, women are most in charge of this. If someone says, I have four children, you may ask, how does she manage to do that? We should ask, how do they, both men and women, women, uh, manage to do that? So we are fighting to, 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 to put an end to prejudices, even by women. How do we organize? We have to organize together, jointly. We have to advocate for that. 
and without uh, going beyond, I like to focus on the points uh, of the Bar Association. First of all, we have to train in equality, in, 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 in the training given in our Bar Association, adding gender perspective in all master's degree. We have a turnover over of 3 million euros in training programs. So we have decided that in every one of these programs, there should be a subject of um, gender perspective. So that all lawyers are aware of this need to have a gender perspective. Then promoting inclusive language. Maria said that we were the first bar association in Spain. We are not lawyers male lawyers in Spanish, there is a difference between male lawyer and female lawyer. Um, linguistically speaking, we use a neutral word, lawyering. We don't talk anymore about lawyers. It's true that there were important male lawyers in Spain that advocated for rights and freedoms of citizens. That's why we are also working to make those women who also were a symbol of fight to make them visible. During every month of the year, we have made visible one of the most important female lawyers in our country, Maria Soteras, our first women, women, female lawyer in 1977, and then many other more who came after her or even Victoria, uh, Victoria Kent, Clara Campoamo, then the need to have policies and measures to ensure the presence of women in decision-making bodies. We want institutions, uh, ministries, associations, fight for having an equal representation, 50-50. Uh, an association has been established in Catalonia, which is called 50-50, fighting for uh, parity. Our bar association has a board which, is, uh, which has eight men and eight women. I wouldn't have run for an election where there was not a paritary team. That was very clear to me. We have to defend this parity in all sections, committees, commissions of, of our bar associations and in other magazine. There's also parity. Everything has parity. We never organize anything without equal conditions for both men and women. We have opened a reporting channel so that women can uh, let us know um, these um, inequalities, pay gap, glass ceiling, harassment, so that women can report this and we, through mediation, can fix this, settle this inequality situation because it's not the same um, uh, what a woman can think that something is uh, unequal is not this is not may not be the same as a man perceives it, and we should have a quality label uh, recognizing certifying that we respect uh, gender uh, equality. The our bar association will uh, grant equality labels to all those companies who really respect this. Thank you for listening to me. I have no doubt that cooperation is of the essence to fight against this problem which still exists. Inequality, with the help of you all, will try to make a, a fair society uh, and more equal. Thank you very much. Bueno, como as everybody has been very good at keeping to their times, we have five minutes for questions, if there are any. We will only have time for one or two, but we do have that possibility. Good morning. It's been a pleasure to listen to all of you. This is an enriching experience to see this exchange of knowledge. Since we're talking about um, justice with a gender perspective in legal practice, 
I am a lawyer. I am a duty lawyer in gender violence. I would like to just talk about the role of my colleagues in attending uh, the women affected by this violence. I know that Maria Eugenia, uh, and most of you do this, but I w would just like to use this opportunity. Gloria gave me the chance to attend. I would just like to say that we are really, you know, working hard with these situations. I've seen at an international level the situation in other countries, but I do think we have um, a lot of energy uh, at 3 a.m. when we get a call from the police office, the police station, you know, we're there and ready to help. I just want you to know that we form a working group which is 100% dedicated to everybody. Thank you. Good morning. It's been a pleasure to listen to you all. I come from Argentina. I work in the Gender Violence Office in the Supreme Court. I would like to ask Rita from Portugal whether you could talk a little, little bit about the rehabilitation programs. Thank you for that question. The program is carried out by the institution called Directorate General for Reintegration and Prison Services or Rehabilitation. This is an institution that forms part of the Ministry of Justice. It collaborates with the courts in uh, enforcing the sentence. It consists of interviewing the offenders and also uh, psychological um, uh, studies and an analysis of uh, awareness. It can include a certain element uh, to treat addictions, for example, to alcohol or drugs. Uh, narcotics. It lasts 18 months. During that time, they have to attend the interviews, they have to uh, talk with the technical staff, they have to meet their obligations, uh, working on their awareness in order for them to understand the reasons for the behavior. That's what we do with um, offenders who commit sex, um, gender violence against women. Thank you. I'm sorry we un Ah, thank you. I would like to say that in the so-called third world countries, uh, which are always considered to be behind the rest, from everything I've heard yesterday and today, we can uh, feel consoled, we can, it's a certain degree of consolation, the fact that all countries in the world suffer this problem. It seems to be a kind of epidemia. I would like to add one further comment. Perhaps you are not aware of what happens in countries such as mine, Libya. In, well, Libya seems to be forgotten, as I said uh, previously, uh, with regards legislation, we have equality in our laws, and the problem is not to do with the laws, but rather in their enforcement. The women in Libya have achieved their rights in theory, 100%, but in reality, in the workplace, we can see that men, although 
We may be talking about somebody with lower qualifications. It's the man who has to be the boss and the woman who may be better qualified. The woman always has to be the subordinate. So I think that this is not just a, a situation that occurs in Libya. I think that happens around the world. I would like to say that this conference is very good and I have uh, found it very, very useful. But in reality, in Libya, we are undergoing transition. So we would ask you to uh, share your experiences with us. Uh, hold out your hands to us, because following recent changes in Libya, women have been excluded from many areas of employment and now that we are seeing new laws uh, there is a backward movement the rights that women had until now they are trying to take them away we feel fear we think that over the next few years well we, we don't know what will happen we don't know whether everything will work out well or whether we are going to uh, move backwards. There may be uh, mutual uh, ignorance perhaps on both sides, but I would urge the international community above, of, above all the judicial powers and women to help us, please. Thank you. Thank you. I'm from Mexico. I would like to ask Dr. Rita. I understand she is a prosecutor. I would like to ask what is done when there has been a trial, the prosecutor, the lawyers, we have the judge ready to give their decision. There's a process involving violence and the victim resists. You know, they've worn themselves out. The lawyers have done their work. This woman finds herself in this violent cycle so, and she withdraws the, you know, from the case. What can we do? There is a, the principle of not allowing mediation when there is violence. But what should we do when we see that there's somebody in a violent cycle and we can see that the, the victim is, uh, has decided to abandon the prosecution? What can we do in such situations? I can give my opinion, but I think that there are many people, well, in Spain, from the point of view of Spain, we're talking about a, what's considered a so-called public crime. Once there's been a trial with evidence, the judge interprets that with a perspective, with a gender perspective. The judge would have to give the ruling, and if there is a conviction, that's what should happen, because we're talking about the so-called public crime. The fact that the woman withdraws from the uh, process, that doesn't mean that there cannot be a decision. It's true that this often happens because mm, the only proof is the uh, victim's testimony. And in Spain, we're looking at when uh, cases when women uh, halfway through uh, withdraw from the case. Um, there is a lot of discussion and debate about whether we should still use their initial declaration or not. There's a lot of work being done with regards to the, the law at the moment. In the case that you have given, uh, we'd have to interpret the proof in the case with a gender perspective and if the violence is taking place, which is what you've said, because you're talking about a, a vi the victim of a, of a violent cycle, then there would be a conviction with the on the basis of the proof, even though the victim does not um, testify. Violence is a public crime, as we call it. So uh, the testigo can 
testify or not, that doesn't mean that the violence can go unpunished. I think that from the point of view of the judiciary, as a lawyer, we often see that if the witness doesn't want to take part, people begin to think, well, if she doesn't want to take part, then there's this uh, tendency to forget. But no, or people think it will be forgotten. But no, if there is proof, obviously we're talking about proof. Here we have uh, you know, the presumption of innocence to start with, but there must be proof. I'm sorry, the speaker was not using the microphone. Not here. In Spain? No. That's why I said I can talk about the situation in Spain. Maybe in other countries it will be different. In Spain, we are talking about a public crime and the prosecutor's office would persecute, uh, prosecute sorry, the offender. Yes, very quickly. There are some situations uh, in which it, what Maria said is true. The investigation has to look for other evidence, not just depend on the victim's statement. But if the victim does not want to uh, testify at the end or desists, as you say, what happens is that the relationship of the victim from the, the moment of the complaint until it reaches the courts, the relationship that they have with the police, with the prosecutors, the lawyers, with the judges, this is crucial. The woman must feel support within the courts, um, treated like a victim, and if she has that, she will feel supported and she will not withdraw and she will testify. That's been studied. So that's why I talked about the importance of the relationship with the victim. Yesterday the, the Supreme Court of Justice said something very important which is that the victim sometimes doesn't know what they're saying because they're just um, overwhelmed, they're uh, tired uh, by the whole thing. And that's true because it can be very difficult, the, the whole process. I'm afraid I cannot give, I cannot allow any further questions. The organizers have said we cannot have any more. We have to stick to the schedule, but you can maybe take the chance to ask questions during the break. Thank you.